Hey everyone, how are we doing today? Um, I know my team was out partying all night, but it looks like you guys are all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So let's get started. This is gonna be a dark talk. This is gonna get really, really real. Um, and I wanna be clear, like, I think that this is a conversation that we need to have. Um, this is not me like burnt out on crypto or hating crypto. Like I love this space, but I think that sometimes we're just a little bit um, too keen on <laughs> patting each other on the back. So we're gonna do something a little bit differently. So I'm gonna go through these slides really quickly, but basically in the beginning, blockchains sort of emerged as the next logical step from the internet. And the internet allowed people to transfer data, transfer information, and the blockchains then are gonna enable people to transfer value. And when we talk about value, we talk about assets, we talk about property, we talk about money, we talk about all these things that are tangible and intangible. Um, and Mark Andreessen recently had a podcast that was really great. Um, and he said that one of the original sins of the web, like back in 1993, was that payments weren't incorporated into the browser. And because of this, so many people ended up relying on advertising, which then led to, you know, all the data collection, all the invasions of our privacy, um, everything just being misaligned, and, you know, the general state that we're in today. Um, but the reality is that blockchains and the internet and any sort of innovations don't solve the human or the social problems that we have. It doesn't create new humans, it's just new technology. And it's what we do with that technology that matters. So technology can aid us, um, but the reality is that people in general are never satisfied. <laughs> they're generally pretty selfish. Um, they're totally willing to impoverish others. Um, and it really manifests itself in greed and vanity and all this other stuff. And we see this all the time in the space with ICOs, with the scams, with the fishers, with all of these terrible, terrible things. And, you know, when we talk about history, we talk about the early internet days, and then we look at how crypto is evolving, it's not going to be the same. History never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. And so we can take lessons that we learned from the internet, and we can hopefully maybe not make the same mistakes as we're building out this ecosystem. So there's a lot of, lot of really, really big similarities between early uh, internet and like early blockchains. So small players were thriving. Uh, there's not really a super commercially viable situation going on. Um, it's not really super organized. Um, and there's this deep-seated belief that we should decentralize and we should distribute that power um, and that we should share the knowledge. Um, but as we have seen, the web actually enables more abuse of power and more surveillance. So while we wanted to decentralize, while we wanted to, you know, give the information and give the data and give the power to all of the people, the reality is, is that the web resulted in both the government uh, and private corporations like Google and Facebook invading our privacy constantly. Um, and so we should ask ourselves, why won't crypto turn out this way? The reality is, is that when we look at blockchains, it's a public ledger and anyone can obtain basically your entire financial history. And then when you combine that with all the information that dApps are going to have, you know, we're talking about healthcare dApps, we're talking about social dApps, we're talking about governance dApps, you have a huge data set just willing and ready to be mined. Um, and we want to make sure that nobody, nobody is going to profit and benefit from basically fucking us, right? We don't want that. So why the heck does this even matter? Well, because when I got in this space, I was excited to build something new. I was excited to be part of like a revolution, right? I think everyone has their blockchain rabbit hole moment um, and it's new and it's exciting and there's all this potential. But there's also the real possibility that we're building the exact same system that we currently have and there's also the possibility that that system is going to be worse than the system that we currently have. Blockchain technology in itself is actually really interesting from a technical perspective, but 
when we talk about humans, when we talk about people, when we talk about social issues, blockchain is just a, a tool that we can use, and it's how we use that tool that will determine what comes of it. Um, and if we aren't careful, uh, and this is, by the way, like the path that we are currently on, we're gonna see more centralization, we're gonna see more intermediaries, we're gonna see more information asymmetry, we're gonna see more risk. And whenever you have those things, whenever you have a centralization of power and a centralization of risk, you're gonna end up um, basically dead or in a really, 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 really shit situation. And back to like how I started this talk, right? Like, if we're not honest with ourselves and what we're building and what we're trying to achieve and how we're going about achieving that, we don't have accountability. We don't have accountability to each other. We don't have accountability to ourselves. Um, and we don't want to sit around and pat ourselves on the back because we overcame some design hurdle or some regulatory hurdle, um, you know, especially when overcoming those hurdles was done basically by centralizing things, right? Like making sacrifices, making compromises. Because as we all know, death by a thousand cuts is still death. So it doesn't matter if we get our heads just chopped off right away, or over time it just degrades and we make compromises and we make sacrifices, the end result is going to be the same. And if we are building this beautiful, nicely painted, Lego castle, but it's made of shit. Eventually that Lego castle is going to erode and the shit is going to be the foundation for the world that we and our children and our grandchildren live with. And we're gonna have to live with ourselves knowing that we helped create that future. So what exactly is the end goal? What are we trying to achieve? Why are we here? I can tell you this, decentralization is not an end goal. It's not a value proposition. It's just decentralization, right? It's a feature, it's a tool, it's a means to the end, but it's not the end goal. Just because you made something decentralized doesn't make it valuable. We want decentralization because it can lead to this distribution of power, and it can lead to a single entity not having power and not having the power to abuse us. If I think about what I want this space to achieve and what I want sort of like the, the end goal to be, what success looks like, this is what I came up with as a very general sort of globally applied goal. It's a big goal but I think that everyone can take this and sort of narrow it down to their own product or what they're building or what they're doing or even just their personal day-to-day -day lives. I want to help create a system where power naturally occurs to individuals rather than central entities. And the reason for this is that if we're able to succeed at this, then we can just naturally have power going to individuals, uh, we can distribute that power more equally, um, we can give the people power to consent. We can give people more choice. We can start aligning incentives. And by the way, this doesn't mean that this will happen, right? It just means that it's more likely to happen. Like we're going down the right path at that point. And when we talk about success and winning and what we're trying to achieve, we have to also keep in mind that you are what you measure. And what I mean by that is that if you are hyper-focused on some metric, you, were, you will become that metric and you will succeed at increasing, decreasing, whatever that metric is. And a perfect example of this is um, reducing crime. So we have all these things and all these metrics on crime, but it's very hard to tell and a lot of research shows that when people are hyper-focused on quotas and reporting crime and uh, monitoring the metrics and stuff, basically, less crime gets reported, but there's not less crime, right? Those are two separate things. And so when we're talking about the blockchain, we're talking about crypto, we're talking about our products, these are the things that we're measuring right now, right? We're measuring market cap, we're measuring price, we're talking about daily active users, we're talking about transactions per second. We're saying that my coin beats your coin, right? These are the things that we're hyper-focused on. But if you think about it, these 
aren't measuring the success. Because remember, success is a system where power naturally occurs to the individual rather than in these central entities. And nothing on this list measures that success. So we need to figure out a new way to measure what we're doing and measure whether we're being successful and evolve from there. My biggest fear is that if we're too focused on this money aspect and more people, more active users, all of this stuff, we're gonna end up hyper-focused on competing with people like PayPal, the banks, Venmo, et cetera. And we're gonna basically sacrifice and make compromises with decentralization so that we can improve the design, we can improve the usability, we can compete with them on that front. Um, but then are you really competing with PayPal, right? Are you really providing a user a choice? Are you really providing the user a new system, right? Because for me, PayPal versus Venmo isn't really giving the user a choice. They're the same thing with a different name. The blockchain is supposed to be more than that. I really don't want to see this ecosystem go down a path where we end up reproducing a system that we so vehemently attack. So just to hammer this point home, there's not like the usability, design, availability to the middle class, availability to the Western world, right? These are not issues. Like I can use PayPal, I have a bank, right? Those aren't problems. And if you're trying to solve a problem, then you should probably go over to the other column and look at things like where the asymmetry of power lays, where the asymmetry of information lays. Where's the lack of access? Is it in San Francisco? Is it in Silicon Valley? I don't think so. Okay, where's the lack of insight? Where's the lack of consent? Where's the lack of choice? Solve those problems. Because if you're only going to compete with usability and design, you are basically going to be uh, an existing product in an existing system competing with an existing product in the existing system, not in the new system that we're trying to build. So to be a little bit more optimistic, where, how do we do that, right? Where, where do we need to go? How do we get from where we are today to where we are tomorrow? And it's uh, quite simple when you put it like this. Obviously, it's much harder to execute successfully, but basically you wanna find a problem, you wanna solve that problem, then get your solution in the hands of people, and then you change the world, and it's really that easy. <laughs> okay, and getting, like one of the biggest things right now, right, is getting users, getting people, getting people that aren't in this space uh, to use our products, to understand our products, to understand this world, et cetera. And so things that make adoption easier, okay, use cases, duh, solving really common problems, um, making things easy to access, making it a fun experience that people can enjoy and people can experiment with, um, and especially if they can experiment with little to no risk, um, and then just general awareness, right? So how do we get our message and our philosophies and our values out to the bigger, broader world and prove to them that this stuff is actually worthwhile? And at the end of the day, there's no technology that is gonna solve these problems right? They'll help solve the problems. They'll be the tools that we use. But people like me, like you, like anyone who watches this ever, you guys have the ability to solve these problems. Because at the end of the day, the problems we're trying to solve are people problems. They're social problems. They're human problems. The technology is just, we just have to evolve it, and we just have to use it with everything that we know and we love to actually solve the human problems and make the world a better place. And some of the most important things when we think about adoption, yes, we want things to be easy to use. Yes, we want things to be fancy. Yes, we want things, we just want all the users, right? We want the graph that goes like hockey stick up into the freaking atmosphere. But how do we do that? And one of the most interesting things about sort of social change um, and how people and culture like evolves over time is that collaboration, education, and like shared vision, shared experience are all really, really common. So when people work together, when they're personally invested in something, when they understand the vision, when they understand the philosophy, when they understand the underlying stuff, they therefore are really empowered to help out and join the cause. And then over time, the entire sort of system, the entire society slowly changes. And 
this is not an exhaustive list, but one of the things that we've seen historically is things like narratives and storytelling and rituals are like so common, right? This is how information got passed along in the dark ages, and this is how information still gets passed along today. So we should be focused on things like that. We should be focused on our communication. We should be focused on creating shared experiences with people that are maybe not 100% like us. Um, and we should share our optimism, and we should share our belief, and we should share examples of why this is useful, and we should get people excited in the same way that we're excited. I don't want anyone to ever underestimate the value of sharing our values because a lot of times we want to abstract things away, right? We want to um, not let people know how the sausage is made. But especially in the early days and as we're building, it's very powerful to share our philosophies, to share our vision, to share our passion because those people can also help us build, right? It's not us versus them, it's like us and then they are also us. And that's where the power really lies. And lastly, honesty and open discourse are probably some of the most powerful tools that we have and some of the most powerful things that we can do at conferences like this, where us, <laughs> the current us situation, is together and in person. Um, it allows us to be accountable. Um, it allows us to be honest with ourselves, which then in turn allows us to be honest with each other and in turn makes our products a lot, a lot better. All right, okay, two minutes. So, that was my talk, but we have some freaking so super exciting news. Ambo, our mobile application, we just launched a huge update to iOS. Android is like literally coming out the door this week. Um, we have new tokens, we have new fiat on-ramps, we have new designs, everything is better. The liquidity is like through the roof now, it's amazing. Um, the design, like really they did a, just a great job. I'm super, super excited, they've been working so hard. And then my crypto, we have like a whole new freaking thing. Okay, so if you guys know my crypto, it's a wallet interface thing, uh, but typically when you arrive at our site, you like do an action, like you want to send, you unlock, you send, and then you go away and that's it, right? So we're going to change that up a little bit and we're going to give you a dashboard and the dashboard is going to have a breakdown of all of your stuff. So you have all your tokens uh, across all of your accounts. And these accounts are any account on an EVM blockchain thing. So Ethereum, Corley, Robsten, uh, Ethereum Classic. I don't know if music coin is still a thing, but it's there if it is. And you can check it out right now at beta.mycrypto.com. It's a little rough around the edges, but we are like literally pushing commits every single day and we're super, super excited. And um, then we also redid the send assets flow and it's freaking amazing because it just works and you can just send from any account and any asset from any account directly from the interface. And uh, of any our designer is like, <laughs> literally amazing and flip the whole thing on its head and it just works, it makes sense and I love it. And our team has literally been at this conference pushing commits and I'm pretty sure they're pushing commits right now to get this ready for you. So please go to beta.mycrypto.com, use it, love it, report bugs to us, Every, like literally just tell us anything. Uh, we wanna make this amazing, we wanna make this better uh, and we wanna make it better for you all and how you use our product. And thank you, and I love you, and I did not even go over time, what? <laughs>